Welcome everyone to episode nine of the What Sales and Marketing Got to Do With It podcast. My name is Gemma Adair, founder and principal marketing consultant at Riata Consultancy. This podcast aims to delve deep into the minds of sales and marketing industry leaders, uncovering what keeps them up at night, what drives their passion, and how they execute successful strategies in both their personal and professional lives. I'm delighted to welcome Shazad Dilmahamud, Marketing Executive at the Alito Foundation. Great to have you, Shazad. Thank you for having me, Gemma. How are you? Good, very well. How's your day been so far? Can't complain. It's not been not been too busy. So enjoying this uh, free time with the podcast as well. Oh, awesome, awesome. So less about me, more about you. Um, please introduce yourself in more detail and what you do. Yep. So before anything, uh, first and foremost, I'm a Muslim. So that's going to be one of my core principles and values and how I carry out my work and how I go out about anything. But professionally, I'm a marketing executive at the Elita Foundation. That's where we obviously know each other. We've worked on projects together before. And yeah, I left school at 16. I think that, I, well, formally I left school at 17. The last day of um, school was my birthday, my 17th birthday. And I um, always had a passion for marketing and business. So now I've become that. I've sort of carved my own path, become... Uh, someone in the marketing industry, passionate about business growth. So I've helped companies before scale. And um, yeah, that's pretty much a little bit about what I'm interested in, passionate about marketing, business growth. And um, yeah, I like to use my skills and resources to give back to community as well. So then a little bit of like volunteering projects here and there. So yeah, that's the main bulk of it. Perfect. And where did your marketing journey begin? How did you get into marketing? What was your first role in marketing yeah. so my first role was actually a internship at ted baker's marketing team so i was able to shadow their global marketing team but that was in covid so when i left sixth form i did have a plan it wasn't just something that just came out of nowhere <laughs> um i was looking for an apprenticeship in uh, marketing marketing or sales i was always very business orientated so i said i need a skill that businesses need so i thought marketing and sales are the two any industry sort of needs so I said, let me just get a job in one of them. And um, I ended up not getting an apprenticeship because of COVID. So I was in the end stages of one, and then they said, no more apprentices, COVID's here. So I see that that was quite a big uh, pushback. And then luckily, through personal network, my aunt actually was a senior at Ted Baker, so she got me into the internship. And this is the first time I really saw the power of personal network. So I understand that I'm privileged in this because from that internship, my father had a connection with another person who had a connection with another person who had a connection with another person at Alito. Then I went to there and I used the experience I got from Alito to find other clients and sort of move around. So that was my first instance at really understanding the power of personal network. So that's pretty much how my, my journey began with a lot of talking, presenting myself, pitching myself, and bouncing around different different relationships to see where I can really add value. Awesome, awesome. And I think um, what I'll do is we'll probably touch upon networking, like the power of your network later on, but I think it's it's a very, very valid point, right? Your network, I mean, they say your network is your net worth, um, but I think, I think to network is so much more than that. It's about not just showing up and, and, and so on. It's about really kind of nurturing the people around you, adding value, um, and so on. So we'll, we'll touch a, a bit upon that later on. Have you faced any sort of challenges or blockers perhaps in your marketing career or, or, or perhaps any of the positions that you've kind of been in? So and, a big, and what were they? And, and how did you kind of overcome them? Yeah, so a big one would definitely be obviously that COVID era. Um from the internship to the time that I started my first role, it was still, it was a second lockdown. So then it was still very hard to find a role or find a position. So there was that. And then also the fact that I was quite young with a lack of experience. So I, because I left school just before A-levels, I didn't obviously have an A-level either. So there was that lack of experience, lack of education. And then also my young age. 
So it gives a, it puts in someone's mind a, a first judgment. So I had to sort of overcome that judgment. But now I think I've definitely been able to get past that through the gaining experience and really developing myself personally. So because I haven't got a job or because I'm not in education, it doesn't mean I couldn't develop myself. Nice. There's hundreds of thousands of courses online. So these are the things that I could use to really create the building blocks that I had to then pitch myself further. Amazing, oh, amazing. I love that. I love that the whole kind of building blocks and and kind of like that whole kind of self um like education and yeah. and kind of mindset as well, I think is is what I'm hearing through what you're saying as well. So it's it's really critical, right? It's about having that that kind of motivation to look for different avenues and tools and techniques and so on to to kind of really kind of set the foundations for your growth. Um, what does a day in the life of Shazad look like currently? Um, yeah, tell us more. Well, it's been a bit hectic since uh, coming back from a holiday. Obviously, everyone's enjoying this August downtime, isn't it? So, but an ideal routine now, it mainly revolves around art. So, we have five periods in a day, so it literally just revolves around that. So that's one good thing is transferred into all aspects of my life is that discipline. So we have to yes. wake up in the morning for a certain time. So now in winter, it gets a bit easier because the prayer is later, so I can wake up at five and then just start my day at five. So my day probably starts around between four and five. And then, yeah, just go out for my day. There's no day that's really the same because all my clients are marketing-based. All my work is marketing-based, but very different so i wouldn't say there's an average day today however i do just make sure in the morning you know you get out the the heaviest tasks because that's when you have the most energy and then throughout the day that energy sort of dwindles down so then at the end of the day i tend to do admin i know a lot of people like to do admin first and the heavier tasks later but i, I sort of keep it so that admin's right at the end of the day and then the heavier tasks at the start i think there's some there's some very good nuggets there about just understanding your, your energy throughout the day and what what times work best for you what what time does your your day end if you're getting up at four and five and you know yeah. prayer and so on what what um what time does your day end so i try to end at 10 it never does <laughs> not because i'm busy or anything but i'm a bit of a night owl so i get a burst of energy as soon as that 10 o'clock goes and that's it i need to go out to eat I need to get dessert. That's one thing. That's my weakness is dessert. So <laughs> when that when that time comes around, I've got a really bad sweet tooth and I end up being in bed at eleven. But eleven or twelve, I'm I'm definitely always in bed. So yeah. Also in the winter, it's easier for us because that late night prayer is earlier. So yeah. In summer, yeah, I'm finished. Summer, summer is my routine. It's all over the place. But now in winter, that's sort of my routine is four to ten. That sort of uh, range. Okay. Okay. We'll touch upon that a bit a bit later on on kind of that work life balance, and um, I'll probably ask you some questions on the desserts and stuff, the <laughs> sweet tooth and stuff. Um, is there an area of marketing that you that you like the most, and is there an area of marketing that perhaps you like the least, but not so much that you like it the least, but it's it maybe an area that you need to kind of work on and de develop. Um, yeah. Tell us a bit more about that. So, that I like the most is just the fact that you get to see businesses grow. You, you as a marketing or salesperson, whatever the two that you decide to go in, you become a very pivotal role in business growth. Without marketing and without sales, you can't grow your business, right? So, I think that's the best thing. It's like construction. I always say, if I wasn't in an office job, I'd do construction because you get to see your work instantly. And it's very similar with marketing. You get to see the outcomes of your results. Might not be instantly, but within an hour, two hours, three hours, a week or a month. It's yeah. something that you get that result quite quickly from. So that's definitely the thing that I most enjoy. Least, I'd say there's two things. Actually doing something would be emails. I hate it. Email, copywriting and all of that. It just is very monotonous. Like you don't, once you get in the flow of emails and stuff, it becomes very similar every day so i i like to like change it up a bit so email writing or copywriting would be one of the more boring tasks that i have to do but something that i also do hate is the misconceptions that businesses have about marketing it, we have like a quite a, this stigma that we're like scammers or we're trying to 
twist things around. <laughs> and that's, that's the worst thing. Because we're not, we're just trying to show you our value. So, and it typically comes with small businesses, not the bigger businesses, because they understand the, the value of marketing. But small businesses definitely have that misconception about marketing yourself. Right. So are you, it's, it's a very good point, because that would, that would be my next question to you in terms of like misconceptions, right? Because there's misconceptions in a sense of when you're pitching, you know, for potential clients or, or prospects. Um, but there's also the misconceptions internally. Mm -hmm. So let's say if you sit within a marketing team and there's the misconceptions that the business had or leadership has on the value that marketing can bring and sales, right? And sales. Is there any other misconceptions that you can, that you've identified or seen within your career? I mean, with my limited experience, it's definitely just that. It's the, that's the biggest one, I'd say, is that you're not really providing value. You're over, it's like when people are in pitch, they tend to use the bigger words and things like that. So they just see marketing as that. It's adding all these flowers and petals around something that's like a boring product. But yeah. it's not, it's making your product better and putting it in front of the people that you want or to buy your product, right? So yeah, I think the biggest one and the one that's affected me the most is that because I only work with small businesses at the moment. So it's overcoming that misconception and then pitching. But always staying truthful as well. I know there's yeah. a lot of marketers that they will tend to, oh, we can do this, we can do that. But then they don't. So, and obviously being someone who is a Muslim as well, we have to go around our business very truthfully. Mm. So that one, it really plays on my conscience as well. So when someone will label you as a scammer or they put that misconception on you, that one's one that I would take to heart. So it's making sure that everything that I do, I am truthful in. And I'm not playing around these misconceptions because at the end of the day, it's responsibility on myself and the trust that you've given me. So I need to, you know, fulfill that. I think that's such a, if I can say, beautiful way to show up. I think that's so key that you show up um, as your true self in line with the, quite what you quite rightly mentioned, like your values and what you represent, um, because it's it's important, right? It's important on how organizations see you how people see you and and all of that and um, for sure I'm a firm believer in sales and marketing alignment and you've been talking about that you know kind of highlighting some of those things there and it's kind of like wow music to my ears right mm -hmm. and I think you have to give yourself some credit and um, given your lack of experience but I think just just your outlook on sales and marketing and, and, and that kind of alignment and misconceptions and so on. It's, it's really powerful. Um, yeah. Like I said, I'm a firm believer in sales and marketing alignment. What's your, your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, without one or the other, you can't really do much. Marketing is the first point of sales and sales is the end point of marketing. So yeah, they, they work hand in hand. They're similar, but they're very different as well. They've got different techniques, different styles of sales, Marketing as well is, I'd say, sales is definitely the harder one to get into because you have to tailor to the industry a lot more than marketing. Marketing, you can have certain strategies that work throughout different industries as long as they're either, you really only have to base it on two things. Is it a product-based business or a service-based business? The sales, every single industry is a lot different. But without one another, again, you can't do anything because they lead to one another. Mm. Marketing you have your funnels and then you'll get your sales team to adjust those people that have come through that funnel. And then once sales is done, you have the marketing again to retarget them to then pitch to them something else and the sales team comes in. So it's like a complete cycle. It's sort of like recycling. You have to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. So that's where marketing and sales really do just work hand in hand. And you see the best organizations, their marketing and sales teams know how to collaborate. They're not a sales team that's pushing their marketing. I need this creative now. Hurry up, hurry up, do this, do that, do this. <laughs> I think that's something that we get pushed about. They think the creative can just be done really quickly. But those that understand the niches of marketing or those that understand the niches of sales when they're in the marketing team, they work beautifully together. It's sort of like a like an orchestra, right? That conveyor belt just keeps going, keeps going. And that's where the business will flourish. Awesome. I think you've been a fly in a wall in some meetings or, or whatnot or some organizations by the sound of it from what you're coming out with it's it's so good to hear I think I think marketing's job 
doesn't just stop there. I I, I look at it like a 360, right? Yeah, like yeah. you said, it's 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 top of funnel, bottom of funnel, and then there's that whole kind of right. You have customers now, then what? Mm -hmm. And that that's what introduced. That's when you introduce like you know customer advocacy and programs and and, and things like that. So it's a a never ending cycle of things. So yeah, yeah, use it to my ears with what you were saying there now. So that's that's really great. How do you stay up to date with what's happening in the market? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's something that I struggle with. I hate, I'm in marketing, but I hate social media. I, I think it's it's great for businesses, terrible for individuals, because there's so much people that just put bad things out there, or there's always someone that's got a voice there, and mm. I believe in free speech. Yeah, everyone needs a, a voice or to voice their opinion, but not everything, right? Sometimes we're too open on social media, and that affects other people mentally, whatever. So... Keeping up to date for me is a struggle, but I've got my news that I just keep up to date with. The bigger stuff that I can keep up to date with um, trends and stuff like that. I'm more up to date on Instagram. So TikTok, I sort of died out with. I, a lot of my friends think I'm an old man, don't know anything. Don't know anything. <laughs> but because of that, because of my friend groups, I, mean, I am able to stay up to date. So I sort of get my snippets from the people that I'm around and not, not really from my phone myself. Okay. Any other sort of any other sort of news feeds or any other sort of websites or anything that you look at other than you know social media sort of marketing? Because my roles tend to be more social media based and the target audience that I I do work with are in that demographic of the social media range, so mm -hmm. under forty. So yeah, I, I only really have to stay up to date with the social media trends, especially since obviously the companies that I'm working with. If that's their target audience, I'm not going to go read up about what trends are in the 40 to 60 market. So, yeah, it's mainly really social media that I have to keep up to date with. Um, I've not really seen a time where I have to keep up to date with a trend that's outside of it. Okay. And the um, companies that you work with, are they charity? Are they cross-sector? Do they offer sort of different types of products and services? So previously, cross-sector, but now I'm definitely working more with charities and things like that. Um, something that I'm really passionate about, and you would know this, is obviously the podcasting one as well. So that's something that I'm looking more to. So podcasts and charities are the two that I really like to uh, niche down and really work with. Um, but yeah, I'm just open to any company, really. But again, all the companies that I've worked with, it's the same demographic. It's that social media demographic between... 18 to 40. So okay. that's the, the demographic that I really have experience with and I understand what's going on, especially because I'm in that age range as well. So it's easier for me to relate, easier for me to market as well, because the best marketing is the one where it's relatable, provides value, provides real insights that everyone cares about, not something that we faked because everyone can see through that nowadays. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Again, it goes back to that being authentic and yeah. you know, putting putting content out there that doesn't mislead people exactly. um i think that's just that that's what you call with bad marketing right yeah um if if a young person like yourself wanted to get into marketing marketing what advice would you give them the biggest one is just self-improvement personal development in all aspects not just finding the courses on marketing but that would also be the, the main one but also getting your mindset right Everyone nowadays, there's a, there's a weird misconception about this hustle culture on Instagram where mm. just put in these hours and you, you get the results. But it's also giving people the idea that business is easy when it's not. Because you're going to have times of struggle. You're going to have times where you're going to have pushback. And all of the pushbacks mainly revolve mentally. If you can keep fighting through them, you're going to find success. But unfortunately, nowadays, I think my generation especially is very, very soft. So one pushback that's it they're finished or they think their first idea is going to get them the traction when really and truly it's going to take them 10 20 30 ideas to really push forward and see success so the biggest one is just improve yourself find the education even if like, i'm not i didn't go to university i didn't go to sixth form well i left sixth form i still had to do courses i still had to improve myself still mm -hmm. had to get the mentor these are the things that you're going to have to do and this is what the reality of business is you're not going to get handouts like in school where your teachers are just going to constantly help you 
you're going to go out there, you're going to have to spend your own money, spend your resources, spend your time and search for that education. So the biggest one for me would definitely be just learn more about your industry and don't be arrogant in that sense. A lot of us, especially young men, we think, oh, we're, we're big, we know everything, we're, we're this, we're that, no one can touch me. And I had this mindset as well, but you will soon really get humbled in business if you're like that. So don't nice. be arrogant and learn, learn about your industry. Nice. And, you know, separate to what you've just touched upon there now, has family been an influence? Has your network been an influence? Friends been an influence? Um, you know, have they contributed to, you know, how your how your mindset is now, how you kind of just show up, that kind of thing? Yeah. Definitely, obviously, the ideal person, I wouldn't be here about that personal network that my family have been able to to bless me with so personal network obviously was a big one but when it comes to mindset I was lucky enough to very early on in my career have a mentor who put me in front of teams where despite my age only being 17 I was managing teams I was also seeing what it takes to really run a startup so that really shifted my mindset and showed me that you can't really get overwhelmed when it comes to all these tasks and difficult things that you'll see you just need to push through and I think that's also related to different aspects of my life where you get a pushback, you just keep going. So a big one is definitely the experience that I've had with my mentor. And um, I'd say definitely, again, being Muslim as well, we, we're taught with hardship comes ease. So having that in your head, you know, okay, this is tough right now, but I'm going to have ease in the end. And at the same time, without difficulty, you won't enjoy the good. It's like someone who's born rich doesn't really know anything else someone who's born poor and then becomes rich they, they really value that journey they really understand the value of what they have now so i think it's, it's that as well just really understanding it's temporary mm. and that there will be joys in the end so it really enjoying that journey of success even if i don't make it at least i know i've enjoyed this journey and you've made a go of it and it's something exactly. that you wanted to do and you you tried it out type thing. You talk about your faith um, um, quite a bit. Like, wh why is your faith so important to you? I think you've touched on on it throughout, throughout the podcast, but why is your faith important to you? I'd be nothing without it. And I think with, you can't really... Um, I, don't know, I wouldn't be able to progress the way I have without it because it teaches you such vital lessons and I think to be the best person possible I've needed the lessons that are taught so yeah without it I'd just be, probably be a lost cause I'd not have the proper compass or guidance that I needed to stay on the right path and really understand what my goals are because it's all fun fun to have these goals of having success but why do you want that success yeah do you want it to just be greedy and become someone that really just doesn't use their wealth for any good no we want the wealth because we want to provide for our families. We want to give back to charity. We want to do all these things that help people. So this is now a new reason to gain wealth. So now it's a bigger picture, right? Because of that, because I know other people rely on it now, I'm even more motivated to go in, go in and getting that. So it's, that's why it's played such a big factor because it's really made me understand what my intentions are behind it and keep me motivated to go and get that. That's amazing. I think... I think um that whole term of why is underestimated um i think it's so important like you said when when things do get challenging or you face blockers you know within your journey it's it's really kind of going back to that why 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 are you doing what you're doing you know what's the bigger picture right um it's really important we talked about a day in the life of shazad earlier um work life balance how do you create balance between home and work um what does that look like apparently i'm quite boring so I, I don't really have that um and you hear that a lot with especially young people i'm someone that thinks right i'm 20 years old i've got so much energy in me let's put it to work for the next 10 years i've got all this energy that's yeah i'm never going to have again in my life right so i might as well just put it all to work but because of that i've fallen in love with the aspect of work i've fallen in love in love with the aspect of constantly developing myself and um, yeah, so that work-life balance, I've not seen it because I don't believe that it's work. It's something that I'm passionate about. Nice. But at the same time, I know when I'm going to get burnt out or when I don't like something. So when I have these monotonous tasks of email writing, 
I know what how much time I'm gonna spend on it, and I know okay, I'll just do a better task later on. So yeah. But my, my work day, I wouldn't say I'm overly busy. I think everyone has an extra one, two hours in their day to put aside for whatever they want to do. For me, it might be reading or watching a YouTube video or whatever. I don't I'm not really into the whole films or anything anymore, but I try to keep it somewhat productive. But yeah, I still find time in my day to do whatever I want. So I'm, work life balance for me is not a conversation yet. I'm not overly busy. Perfect. No, that sounds sounds great. I think you've you've got the right outlook on on that. I think you've kind of named it. You've kind of um it's what's personal to you, right? It's not work mm -hmm. like you said, it's not a work life, it's not a balance for you. It's about, you know, you're kind of doing what you're passionate about. Um yep. Do you play any sports, like sports, <laughs> anything like that? I like basketball, but I haven't played it probably in probably four years. Um, I've played a couple of times just with my friends, but yeah, that, and I need to get back in the gym, but every time I go, I keep getting injured, so I need to really get back on that one. That's the main one. But yeah, going for walks and stuff is tend my, I'm like an outdoorsy kind of person, so I like to go for a little walk, a little hike. Um, can't do it in this country, but I do like fishing and hunting and things like that. So those are my kind of like sports, but yeah, anything that I can, any time that I can spend outdoors, I will. Awesome! No, that's really great, really great. What did you want when you when you were growing up or when you were little? Did you see yourself as what did you want to do? That's funny because um, I would say I I wasn't passionate, but math, physics, further math, and computing were the subjects that I did in sixth form. So I wanted to go to through that engineering route and uh, yeah but I think that was more of a front just because I was good at those subjects it wasn't something that I was really passionate about because when I had to put in the work I didn't want to do it anymore but in school whenever anyone would ask me what I wanted to do I'd just say billionaire so <laughs> I, was, I was probably always business orientated I just didn't know what business it would be in um, so yeah I tried obviously everyone in school they, when they say they're entrepreneurial, they tried the whole selling sweets and cookies and whatnot in school. So obviously I did that as well. But yeah, I'd always say in the field of business, I didn't want to just do one thing. I wanted to put all my time in different different areas. But it's definitely now geared towards more of a certain route. So now I understand what's important to me or what sort of lifestyle I want to lead. So now the businesses will tend to revolve around that and what my values are. So now it's sort of gearing into the more the targeted direction as opposed to the broad view of I want the business. Perfect. I think it's I think it's a bit like marketing, right? You have to kind of prioritize and know your niche or you know, exactly. and, and how your why aligns with that and and um it's kind of really focusing on on what that looks like, right? It, um I think it's it's really key. Um you talked about charities. You talked about giving back to your communities and so on. Why is giving back and actively participating in local initiatives important to you? There's so many reasons. Obviously, one is to uh, keep it like, in our faith. So charity is something that you have to do anyways. But once you do it and once you get the taste of it or you see that you've helped someone, it's a very addictive feeling. And it, I'd rather be addicted to that feeling than anything else. So, <laughs> it's a good um, feel. It's a good thing to be addicted to, right? <laughs> that feeling. Exactly. I'd rather be addicted feeling. to that. So, yeah. yeah. Once and it teaches you so many lessons. I'd say some, I'm someone who struggles with the idea of patience or dealing with people, but working with children and doing charitable things, I've managed to squeeze that out and become more patient. And it's also something that I'm going to need without my own family, right? In the future, if I want to have a family, I'm going to have to learn some patience. I'm not going to. <laughs> shout my kids all the time so it's given me more life lessons so it's skills that are transferable um is one of them uh training for later life another one and then the fact that it's deep rooted in my faith as well so there's so many yeah there's so many reasons but they all revolve around the idea of it's going to help me as well as help another person and I think it's 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 a very relevant point, right? Or or a great point because if you can help one person, two people, three people, I mean that's that's great, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. I think it's about anything that you can do to help others. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, people help people in different ways, right? 
Um, so it's it's really it's really great. Amongst your sort of um network or, or group of friends, are mm. you the go-to? Would you no. say if <laughs> if um they need some guidance or they've got like a challenge? Um, I'd like to think that I'm somewhat reliable. It's something that I try to say. Like if someone needs a if someone needs an issue being fixed, then yeah, come to me. That's something that I do enjoy, and I think that's sort of played out. But yeah, I'm not the go-to guy. I'm, I'm a nobody. There's there's a lot more better people than me. <laughs> that's that humble, humble of you, Shazad, for sure. <laughs> um. You've mentioned there, you, you've kind of touched upon different things that you're passionate about, what drives you. Is there anything else that you would like to add that you're passionate about and what drives you, separate to what you've already mentioned? The biggest thing, and people have always said this was weird, especially because I said this from young, is my future family. Is is that that's my biggest driver? Is I don't want to be someone that can't provide for them, or I don't want to be someone that can't that I want this, no, I can't do this at the moment. That's a big one for me, because I think that's going to be the one role that is going to be the most challenging but the most rewarding in life, is being a parent or being a husband or whatever. It's going to be that. That's going to be the one that I'm tested with the most as well. So that's my biggest driver, and it's pretty much the, the one that I think about the most. So yeah, I, I think that's my biggest motivation. Obviously, they're not, I don't have a family at the moment. Well, a family younger than me or whatever you get what I'm saying yes <laughs> I, I don't have one at the moment but the idea of it scares me because I don't want to be someone that can't do something for them that's a pretty big thing to be scared about right um, exactly so yeah, yeah yeah and I can see how that would be your fuel to you yeah. know to that fire that kind of like um driver right um yeah. it's really quite quite key is there somebody that inspires you whether dead or alive do i have to know them or not necessarily not necessarily no so there's a few obviously the first one being our prophet the greatest man to ever live so i try and take his teachings it allows me to be truthful honest in the way i conduct business help others and um yeah there's so many lessons that we can learn from him and obviously the greatest man to ever live so that's one key pillar one. Then my family, of course, um, the elders in my family as well. You want to be someone that my grandfather, he recently passed away. He we had a very good conversation before he passed away. So that's one that I, I keep passing oh, to nice. people and uh, one that really motivates me to strive and do things that are good. So there's that. But yeah, I'd say I'd say those are the key inspirations. And then I got a friend, uh, an older friend called Rias. He's a He's a key one as well because he's someone who is also young, but he's done very well in his career and he's got the leadership attributes that I, I strive to have. So he's nice. someone that I can just see and he's already accomplished the things that I want to do. So now I sort of have to tag along and follow his journey, right? So it's, and when you find someone like that who is relatable to you, comes from a similar background from you, and he's not too far like in age from me, but completed the things that I want to do, it makes things a lot more realistic. Because a lot of people say in business, your goals are not realistic. That what you're talking about, that's, yeah, it's not it's never going to happen. But when you find someone that's already done it, relatable, you might as well tag along with them, right? So now I'm sort of like his, uh, glue his arm, unfortunately. Oh, wow. That's, that's incredible. That's incredible. It's great. It's great to hear that you've got like really great people around you. Definitely. Whether whether dead or alive, that you can you know think back, and I think it's nice you touched on your your grandfather and the conversation that you had, and that will always stay with you yeah. through your journey and beyond. You know, it's it's um really great to hear that. Um, and I think everyone's journey is different. Your journey is going to be different, but if you can take you know little nuggets from from people along the way, which will help help you you know build yours then then why not right so that's really quite um great if you could speak to your younger self what would you say to them so this is where my arrogance is going to come out because <laughs> i just say yeah carry on I, I have confidence in myself so there's no extra advice that i'd give i think everything's happened for a reason whether good or bad so 
yeah, that's the, the greatest plan has already happened for me to get me here today. Otherwise, I want to have this conversation. Maybe, you know, obviously the butterfly effect, right? If I change one small thing, it wouldn't happen. So, yeah, I have confidence on back myself. So even to my older self, I would say you've done it. To my younger self, I would say carry on doing it. Amazing. And what would you, what would you um what advice would you give to someone that's younger than you or someone perhaps the same age that's just not there as yet or perhaps not in the right mindset or perhaps is is facing difficulties for whatever that might look like right yeah. um what advice i think you a big one that we all struggle with is the open-minded so when someone gives you advice we tend to look at someone who's better than us in terms of either earning capacity or career whatever it is if you're good it's but i think we need to humble ourselves a little bit and take really taking the advice of the people that give it obviously don't go to your barber for health advice, but still listen to what they have to say. It's being open-minded to all pieces of advice and removing that arrogance that we all seem to have as teenagers. Because mm. we think that we know it all and stuff like that. I briefly mentioned it earlier. So I think just keep an open mind and understand that the people that are giving you advice, whether it be parents or elders, they do want, want what's best for you. And sometimes you're gonna have to just bite your tongue and really understand what they say. So yeah, open-mindedness is key. Amazing. Now that's some um, really great advice, yeah, to someone that's younger and to those that are, are further in age, right? Um, arrogance can can you know creep in every now and again, and you kind of have to just check yourself and kind of regroup, right? Um where do you see yourself in five years? Mm, I'm not at the moment I'm uh in two minds about my past, but definitely in a place where professionally, personally, spiritually, every aspect, I'm someone who's confident in my own ability, someone who's able to provide and support a family. And um, yeah, someone that can just really depend on themselves in that aspect. So just being someone that can become that person of support and provision, I guess. Amazing. What do you want to be remembered by? I think that's a, that's a difficult one. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really care when it comes to fame or anything like that, about the community, but I think the people that know me, I'd like them to know me as someone who was reliable and dependable and someone who really fulfilled their rights and treated them well. So I think that's, that's, the, that's the one that I would go with. Awesome, awesome. And just some lighter sort of questions. Um, <laughs> If, like, when you do go on holiday, what do you like to do? Or where yeah. would you go on holiday and what would you like to do? So I'm from Mauritius and that's probably my favourite favorite place to go. So you've got family there. But you can sort of let loose. You're like a wild animal over there. You can do what you like. So I like to do a lot of climbing, whether it be waterfalls, trees and things like that. So that's uh, one thing. Fishing, boating, kayaking, hunting. Wow. <laughs> a lot so yeah i'm a recently as well i don't think i'll be able to do it again with my family because they don't want to go back but fishing and hunting is two that i enjoy um fishing is is great but it can be quite i wouldn't bring my friends that i think they'd be a bit real like that's disgusting oh i but, see because <laughs> we, we do fishing in a weird way we don't tend to use a fishing rod we okay. use our hands so oh, you, have wow. to go out, you have to go out at night but we're not catching fish, we're catching like prawns and octopus. Oh. So you're going out at night, you have to spot out for them, really pick them up. So those are the things that I like to do. So I think dream holiday destination would just be go back to Mauritius, really spend, enjoy that time that I have and uh, make the most of it. Do all these outdoorsy things that you don't really get to do in all parts of the world. So, yeah. Amazing. With us, with us being from the UK, we look at Mauritius like the tropics, right? Yeah, but everyone seems to like it for the honeymoon thing. Obviously, I've, I've not done that, so <laughs> that's not my reason. I don't, yeah. That it is, is true. Know, when you that go to the true. hotels and stuff, it is quite like a romantic scene and whatnot, but that's not my reasoning. Yes, that is true. A lot of people, when they get married, they go to Mauritius yeah. or get married in Mauritius. It's one of those kind of sought after sort of destinations exactly, yeah. for people to go to. Um, but it's really nice because you, because you're, 
her, you're like your culture or heritage is from Mauritius and you get to yeah. experience like you know um what it's like to kind of live there and stuff like that so that's really cool um do you have a favorite book or one well one do you read books yeah. and what's is there a, a book that you would recommend yeah so yeah i do read books i've taken a little bit of a break recently but i do have a um yeah a few books that i've read um one that i'd recommend well my favorite one or one that i hold closer to me is the richest man in babylon it's because it's the first book that i read in oh yeah so yeah i've read it yeah yeah, everyone seems to read it on their first lot of their journey. That and Rich Dad Poor Dad, right? So it's for everyone first Dad. reads. So that one, just because it was the first book that I read in like 10 years. So when I left Sixth Home, it was the first book I bought. And I probably didn't read the book since primary school, secondary school. So that is one that really started my journey of loving books again. But a book I'd recommend. There's so many. So I, I don't even know, but... Marketing-wise, I haven't really read a book that really niches in marketing, apart from uh, Seth Godin, uh, This Is Marketing. Oh, Seth, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got some of his books as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the first, that's well, pretty much the only marketing book that I've read, but the rest tend to be around personal development and uh, finance and things like that. So Essentialism, Deep Work, they're two really good ones. And maybe, what's the, what, what's the name? adversity is the way that's it ah nice interesting because it, it teaches you to embrace the differences that you do have and embrace the struggles that you do have and use them to overcome obstacles and use them to show that that's your value it, it, it kind of brings a different way of strength that. that you have so those three are the three that i think help the most or the most impactful I love that. I think there's a lot of a lot of great books there that you've just mentioned and different authors that people can kind of um, have a look at. Um, is there any other ways that you kind of digest information, knowledge, podcast? Yeah. You know, we talked about podcast. You talked about podcasts earlier. Um, yeah. Anything, anything there you, that you'd like to share? Yeah, podcast is a big one. I think just this was really easy and you'd be surprised how much you actually pick up, even though you're doing things passively. Because if you're doing tasks and things like that, you just put a podcast on. You're not ten you don't tend to listen to it, but you'll realize later on, oh, I remember this, I remember that. So podcasts is a great way to really what's the word? Really absorb information quickly and passively. So podcast is one, although I don't tune into them as much as I should. Um video content, I'm more of a long format guy, not a short format guy, because I prefer the, the information I know at least something will stick. So I tend to watch some lectures here and there, different talks. And uh, whenever I can, some in-person lessons are good as well. I think we sort of detached from going to those in-person lessons or in-person workshops because of the whole COVID stuff and working remotely. But when I find one that will benefit me, I definitely do like to be there in person, really engage with the person that's delivering the session. Perfect. So in-person sort of events. Yeah things like that awesome awesome if you had a chance to be a superhero or have superpowers of some kind yeah um what would what would that be mine would be to slow down time so probably it's close to the flash or be really fast basically because it means <laughs> okay. let's say i can do a task in two hours i still go through the two hours but for you it looks like i did two minutes so that's my okay. thing. So I'd go so fast where time doesn't actually change, but it's slower for me. Because then I still get to, it's not a cheat code where I can say, if I click my fingers, my task is done. I still get to enjoy the difficulty of the task. But to everyone else, I've done it quicker. Meaning in 24 hours, I can still get more things done whilst enjoying the difficulties of each task. So that, that's my weird, weird superpower. I wouldn't go for the easiest route but just get more things done in a day I guess that's awesome I know I think that's a great it's a great superpower to have mm -hmm. I think I think everyone would want that <laughs> yeah. for sure for sure um just a few more questions now if you had to ask the audience a question what would that be okay so it's not a question that benefits me but I'd say really think about what is stopping you so I'm, I'm going to ask the audience 
or stopping you from progressing to the next stage. Take the time to really think about that and really address it and really think about what you really want to get done and why is it stopping you? What's the thing that's stopping you? Right. That's a, that's a great question to ask, I think, um, for sure. Do you have any final words that you would like to share? Uh, let's stop the whole idea that market, marketers are scammers. Let's uh, understand the value that they bring. That's the that's the main one. Hopefully that can that can go away because then it makes my life easier, your life easier, everyone's life easier. So <laughs> there's that one. And um, yeah, I just uh, think what I said last is think about what's stopping you and really try and address that within this next, we've got four months or three months now left of the year. So let's try and really overcome this last last quarter of the, of the year and let's smash out our goals and prepare for 2024. So I'll leave it at that. And thank you for having me. No, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I think, yeah, just so much good insights um, from, from today. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about just your journey and the next five years, 10 years, you know, what, what that might look like. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, coming your way for sure. But thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me.